Amen. I'll tell you what, if we tried to count all of our blessings, I mean, I don't know, we're pretty negative, so we usually aren't thinking about all the things that God's blessed us with. We normally are thinking about all of our aches and our pains. Amen. Amen. Come on. Don't be, don't be lying. Amen. So if we were to actually uh, sit down and think about it for a minute and write it down, uh, God sure has blessed us. He sure has. And uh, we're so thankful for that. And uh, that's uh, starting to look pretty good out there at the Praise the Lord, and uh, that gives Miss Julia more things she needs to do, and uh, we got to get in and teach her how to put the uh, missionary letters in there, and it's, I guess it's pretty simple. I haven't got that far. We spent over three hours on that uh, 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 just the other day just to get it running, and I'm thankful that it's running. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I appreciate the, uh, the ministry that uh, Brother George does, and uh, he's the one who... Uh, had had uh, created that software and he's very responsive and uh, any issues we have I told him I didn't see one of the missionaries on the screensaver and uh, it was like that and he had uh, responded he has remote access to everyone that uses his program and he was on it man I'm telling you what so I'm just thankful for that it's awesome to be able to see that it's nice to be able to have that uh, connection with your missionaries does everybody have their notes tonight <clears throat> I have extra notes if you don't have them. They're up here on the front pew if you need a set of notes. Huh? Does anybody else need a copy? You need? <coughs> All right. <coughs> All right, we've been talking about the churches. Remember, uh, there is something that I want to go over with you. Have you ever uh, wondered, now, the letter, uh, uh, the book of Revelation, Marcus made sure to correct me on that, and he's right. It's not Revelations, it's Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? And so if you look at that uh, letter that's being written, it's a letter, right? It's written, and it's given by Jesus or by God to John. And if you look at it, and I hope that you'll look at it like this and think about it for just a minute. The first chapter was about what? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1, just kind of a summary. What was the first chapter about? It was a picture of Jesus Christ, remember? Okay, is everybody with me? Okay, and also Revelation chapter 1 also was also to uh, explain to you about the writer. Who was the writer? I just told you. Okay, so it told us a little bit about the writer. Now, I also, uh, uh, the other Sunday, when I went over the, uh, the death of the apostles, what happened to John? Well, he was boiled alive. They were trying to kill him by boiling him with oil, okay? But he survived, and so he's on the island of Patmos. They had tried to kill him by boiling him alive. Uh, he had been exiled to the island of Patmos, which they thought would be torturous, but that was because God wanted him to be alone so God could speak to him and so that he could write to us. Isn't that great? So we see uh, Re Revelation chapter 1, the opening of the letter, the importance of who Jesus is and who the writer was. Amen? And uh, we see where John was in his maturity. Now, chapter 2, why would the second thing uh, that, that is written in the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible, why would the, the, the next important thing, why would that be about the churches? Help me, this is supposed to be teaching time, so why do you think? Now you say, uh, well, where's that in the notes? It's not, so quit looking. <laughs> I mean, that's just how I think. I mean, if we're not going to figure out what's going on, then why are we doing this study? I mean, in all reality, right? What? <clears throat> Church is his bride. But why would he write this letter? Why would the church be the first thing before we get into prophecy? Yeah, yeah, important. Example of the churches. Anybody else? I'm trying to help you think. Okay. And for those that are watching on live stream, I'd be asking you the same thing. Why is the first thing he reveals to us the picture of Christ? He reveals to us who the writer is, humanity of John. And what's interesting about John's humanity, we've learned how mature he was by his humility, okay? And then the next thing he's going to tell us about is seven churches. They're the bride. Anybody else? Anybody else? 
What I think is interesting, there are examples of what to do and what not to do. Notice here, there's important things that the Lord wants the church to know. Now, is this just for these churches? No, it's not, okay? I'll answer that for you. Uh, this, these letters written to these seven churches aren't just for these churches. Now, the, the, what's ironic with the Lord, and I hope that you uh, keep your mind uh, focused, uh, God's is about numbers, and there's seven. And there's not that there's seven, uh, uh, there's only seven churches. There's more than seven churches, but seven, there are seven things that he sees that the church has problem with. Okay, and he understands that these seven problems that these churches have, now each church may have more problems, but each of these seven churches pretty much sum up all the problems that every church all the way down through time are going to have a problem with, okay? Now, <clears throat> what the Lord is trying to show you, number one, of course, Jesus is the most important, just like how he talks to the churches. Number two, he wants to show you who the writer is. But the third, the, one of the next important things before you even get into prophecy, and that's why we've been looking at these churches, is because how in the world, if you've got sin in your heart and sin in your life, how are you supposed to understand prophecy? That's my question. Okay. Now, if, if only one-third of the Bible is prophetic and two-thirds of the Bible is all about going into all the world and teach the gospel, that's more important than prophecy. It is. Okay. Okay. So what is important here for us to understand, to get a hold of, is that God is saying that it is important for you to recognize these issues that I'm seeing in these churches and understand that you've got to get these fixed in order for you to understand prophecy. And he wrote that for all churches through all time. And I'm going to tell you something. As I've studied this, and I've had the awesome opportunity to the last two Wednesdays to uh, study this audibly <laughs> with my mother on the phone. And she's really enjoyed that. And actually, that kind of enhances it for me because I don't know about you, when you're studying something, when you're, uh, when you're speaking it as you study it, it actually helps you learn more. Did you know that? I, it works, amen, praise the Lord. So there are some important things that God wants the church to know that we need to get right before we'll be able to understand prophecy. Now that makes a lot of sense, don't it? <clears throat> so here we see God speaking to the churches before revealing prophecy uh, uh, right. Now hold on, he doesn't dive into prophecy, does he? No, we haven't even talked about it yet. Okay, and so, uh, and I'm going to type this up when I'm done with all the churches, but I have a list here that I've got, I'm going to have a running list here, and I'm going to, I want to just, as we go through this, uh, we've, there are some things that the Lord is warning each church of, okay? <clears throat> now, some of these warnings that he gives these churches, now right now I only have uh, three, uh, but because I'm not trying to study too far ahead, I could have them all written down, but once we get through all the churches, I'm going to print this off, and I'm going to give it to you, okay? Because these are the warnings that the Lord says, hey, before you understand prophecy, because some people say that prophecy is too hard to understand. Come on, help me. And let me tell you something. We're not going to teach the uh, Dr. David Jeremiah Maya prophecy. We're going to teach the Bible prophecy. Okay, we're not going to teach a picture. We're going to teach the truth. Okay, uh, we want to teach it in a way where you can understand it and you can tell others. But the key to understanding Revelations or Daniel why some of us have a problem still with Daniel, is right here. It's right here. Why in the world, if you can't be obedient to what the Lord's asked you, would he give you the dessert? Are you with me? Everybody wants to know prophecy, but don't want to do anything the Lord asked. Does that make any sense? Oh, yeah, I'm going to give you, your t I'm going to give you more for allowance. You won't do your work or your chores, but I'm going to, oh, it's fine. Well, I'll give you $10. No, he isn't going to do that, right? <coughs> Now, you're the lucky kids got allowance. I didn't get allowance. Amen. <clears throat> but anyway, so here's the first warning. <clears throat> I'm going to go over it really quick, and then we're going to get back into, I believe we left at Pergamos. But anyways, the first warning was to the church of Ephesus. Now, this warning that the Lord has given to them uh, before giving the prophecy. Now, notice, he's given it to John to write to John to give to the churches. Okay? So can you imagine being the church at Ephesus? Wait a minute, there's still some of those today. So here's the warning of not being backslidden, uh, of not going through the motions and not having a real relationship. Now, I don't know why, whenever I read or think about Ephesus now, I begin to think of Mary and Martha. 
that I do. Because Martha was all about the work and Mary was all about the relationship. And Jesus says, hey, the, the work don't mean anything without the relationship. Isn't that what he basically said to Mary? Hey, 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 she's doing that which is most needed is what he said about Mary. And Martha was like, what are you talking about? I'm getting things done. He goes, yeah, you're doing things on your own. What good is it doing? You've got an attitude. You're marching around this place cleaning up, and Mary's at my feet worshiping me, building her relationship with me, and you're more worried about doing the dishes and wondering why Mary isn't helping. Sound, sound familiar? Huh? Hey, we, hey, you got, we got more. We got, hey, why don't you have prayer time some other time, right? Oh, we're having prayer time? I'm not interested. Right? I'll tell you what, without that relationship, there's the first warning. God's saying, hey, you need to have a real relationship. Uh, uh, Smyrna, now I'm telling you, this isn't just to the church of Ephesus. This is to the churches of all time. His first warning is, if you want to understand prophecy, you better make sure you have a right relationship. Are you writing this down? This is good stuff. Smyrna, here's the second warning. Now, these are just churches. It doesn't really make a difference about really what's going on. But what does matter and what is applicable for Lighthouse are these warnings. Here we see the, the warning of hardships. Now, let me tell you something I believe there are hardships that are going on today definitely not here now do you know there are Christians that are dying in China <laughs> uh, so there is okay there it is there's another picture of uh, Smyrna happening right now okay you know what the Lord has to say to them continue on through martyrdom there's going to be hardships. Now, not every church is going to have all these things. I'm just, aren't you glad we're not in China? But you know, what about the Chinese that want to hear about Jesus? And so we have here a warning of hardships and to know that we should continue through martyrdom. Not all churches will struggle with all these problems, but we'll go through at least one of them. I believe that we'll have multiple of these problems. This also lets us know of what we will have uh, 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 due to being faithful. Isn't that neat how the Lord says, hey, uh, he always encourages us what to correct, but he also says, if you'll be faithful, this is what I'm going to do. Now, the, the next church which we're getting ready to get into, I want to share with you the warning here. <clears throat> this is the third church. He's telling them that they need to be careful because corruption comes from within, but it comes from without. Now, you'll get that here in a minute because I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, because I wanna, we're going to get into that, okay? And so also with that, uh, well, I'm not even going to get into that. So let's go ahead and look at Pergamos. Open your uh, books up. Open your Bible up, Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> this is probably, I don't know why I get excited to, to teach about these things, and probably because no one is, and it's a shame. Because these things are happening. Now, uh, what's happening in per, uh, Pergamos happened in the Old Testament. And we're going to see that as well. So let's go ahead and open our notes. Are you there to Pergamos, uh, Roman numeral 4? And let's open our Bibles to Revelations chapter 2. Look down at verse number 12. And we're going to read those uh, few verses, 12 to 17. Are you there? All right, it says in verse 12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he, with, uh, he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. <clears throat> yeah, well, we know what that is. huh? I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where, uh oh listen, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Are you listening? But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of... All right, ladies, you guys have been doing a, a, a study... And I know that, uh, as my wife told me, you were talked about the doctrine of Balaam, right? 
who taught the children or who taught uh, 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 Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Wow. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath, saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give unto a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. I like to read those parts, don't you? I'm gonna, I wanted to give you a little something you can write down. Out of all seven churches, all but one, God tells to repent. Which one did he not tell to repent? Smyrna. God comforted Smyrna. Smyrna was faithful, and they were getting ready to go through death. Amen? There's something happens when you're under great tribulation like they are. You don't sin. Are you with me? You ever remember when you were so scared that you were talking to God, and you, you felt like <laughs> you were, he was there? You know what's funny? It's funny that it happens only when we're under severe tribulation. Huh? Can you imagine the feeling of knowing that you're getting ready to be killed for your faith? Well, we don't even understand that, do we? Let's look at Pergamos. Uh, on number five there, I want you to write next to it. Pergamos actually means fortified. That word, I think I gave that to you already, but uh, Pergamos means uh, fortified. Now, let's go on through here. Let's get in. This is good. Uh, A, of course, uh, whenever the Lord talks, he always lets the emphasis know uh, uh, these things. And he, the sharp sword with two edges, of course, that's Christ. Uh, Romans 1 or Revelations 1, verse number, Revelation. Now you got me thinking, Marcus. You see what you did? Revelation 1 and verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp a two-edged sword, and in his countenance was the sun, shineth in his strength. That's Jesus, amen. Uh, that would be him. And so this is Christ. This verse tells us two things about the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting? Every church, uh, the Lord wants the church to know. Now hold on. He wanted us to know all of them. But there were some churches lacking. These seven churches were lacking in a few. I think that most churches today are lacking. And almost all of these. Not really understanding that the Lord is there. Not understanding that God's above time. He's already known how you're going to die. Not understanding that he's all-knowing. Ever-present. The mighty uh, protector. Here's what he wants the church at Pergamos to understand. I like to teach down here. I don't know why. Uh, anyways, the, the first one is the word of God is dis, uh, discerning. Discerning. Boy, that sounds like that verse, doesn't it? Let's turn to that. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. Hold your finger in Revelations and go to Hebrews. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. <clears throat> Got to read this, amen. Hebrews 4, verse number 12. And it says there, are you there? It says, for the word of God, now notice this lines right up with what Revelation said. For the word of God is what? Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divining asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a what? discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart amen the word of God and here's something that uh, he wanted this church to understand and it's rightfully understandable now that we read what was going on remember they're allowing the uh, uh, the doctrines of Balaam in and the Nicolaitans into the church okay and so the Lord's saying hey wait a minute you may think that I only see on the outside who's the word Jesus, you may think that I see on the outside, but wait a minute. He lets them know I am the word, and I am a sharp on either side, and I can see through you, and I can discern you. Well, that's a wake-up call, isn't it? 
You know, uh, when you go to church and you don't feel a little bit of... Uh, uh, <laughs> We were, I was uh, visiting this week, and, you know, when the Word of God is really preached, it does bring us to a point of going, why? Because we're sinners. If the Word of God's not preached correctly, then we won't have any. You know, if you go to church and it's all about, ha, 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 great, then the preaching, that never happened. I mean, church ain't about going there and having a party. Church is about going and hearing the word of God. And the Bible says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, how about you? Uh, every time I've had a knife, even when I'm old, I always end up cutting myself. And uh, when I buy a knife, I remember the last knife I bought when I bought it from a, a store. They, when I take it, you want to take it out and open it, don't you? And the store guy always says, what? Don't cut yourself. Every time I do. I'm like, would you not say that? Can I tell you something? If you go to church, if the preaching will really be preached, then you'll be cut. And how about you? I, didn't, I don't jump up and down for joy when I get cut. And a paper cut hurts just as bad as a sharp knife cut, just so you know. Amen. Come on. So any kind of cut hurts, doesn't it? And how about you? I think a paper cut hurts longer and worse. It just seems to always hurt. I don't understand that. It doesn't make no sense. But I don't, maybe if it leads debris in there, I don't know. But I do know that God says that his word is sharp and it discerns your thoughts. And it should hurt your mind. It's because we're wrong and he's right. The word discerning means this. You can write next to it. It means seeing and knowing. You cannot get out of the eyes or knowledge of God. He's trying to let them understand. You know what? You can sneak these wicked people in the church and you can dress them up like you want to, but I can see and I know. Okay? Hey, hey, we, we can do whatever we want to through the week and think that God doesn't know and then come to church and put on a show. But God says, I see and I know all things. So quit putting on a show. Right? Hmm, I'm telling you. Number two. The second thing that God thinks is important for this church to understand as well as us. And notice, these things that we are looking at, I know we're like, man, preacher, let's get into the prophecy. But God's saying, hey, why don't you get a hold of these truths so that I can explain prophecy? He says the word of God is judging. Uh-oh. Well, we don't like that today, do we? Huh? Hey, don't be judging. Well, let, me, let me quote some verses for you. The Bible says mark them and cause division. What's that? Huh? It's not really judging. That's righteous judging, is it not? So are we to judge or not? Separate from them. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. We're supposed to stand for the truth. What's that? Oh, it's what you're judging. Preacher over there. That's not judging. You wait when they stand before the judge. Who's going to stand up for right? It's supposed to be us. The world's twisted that, and now we've just rode down the train of the ride and, and allowed them to take that away, and we can't say nothing. We're just supposed to keep... Do you know what? You don't say nothing, and you don't vote, then you just enabled it huh the Bible says let the redeemed of the Lord say so why is all these things happening because we've got our mouth shut well I don't want to judge no okay let me help you I'll give you an example someone cusses in front of you you hear it say something please why because they may not have known they said it but once you tell them they'll think about it just like Revelation or Revelations, right, Marcus? I won't forget. Right? He was right. I had to say, yes, you're right, Marcus. It's Revelation. It's not plural. There's only one Jesus. So that's pretty important, isn't it? So next time you say that, you're not going to say Revelations, are you? Hmm. Let me tell you something. Next time that person wants to cuss around you, they're going to think, wait a minute, he told me not to do that. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What do you, what's your problem? Huh? We're just going to accept it, and we wonder why the world's the way it is. The only, thing, the only people to show the light is the church. Okay? Now, but we want to know what Revelation says because we want to know how close it is for Jesus. To, most of us just want to know when Jesus is going to come so that we know that we have extra time to get ready. I'm sorry, you're not going to have enough time. The Bible says he's going to come as a thief in the night, and you're not going to be ready. So if you're not getting ready now, you're not going to get ready. And so, man, I'm telling you what, we better get ready. The word of God is judging. The word judging there means he, he hears and determines. And he's already formed an opinion. Are you with me? 
That's a pretty good judge there, amen. He's already heard, and he already knows. You know, when we go stand before him, he's not going to ask you to give him any answers. He's already heard, he's already seen. He wants you to heal. You'll admit. The Bible says this in 1 John 1, 9, it says we're supposed to confess. Do you know that word means to admit? That means to own. That means that you're supposed to, when you ask for forgiveness of the Lord, you're supposed to go to him and say, yes, Lord, I cussed, I said this word, I accept that I did it. I don't go to him and say, well, if my wife wouldn't have slapped me, see what I'm saying? What am I doing? Well, Lord, she did wrong, so I did wrong, so I'm okay. And then you're not forgiven. Because you didn't admit it. Okay? That's the same thing as saying a prayer, isn't it? Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I want to be saved. But I'm not going to repent. Well, this is hard preaching. That's because the Bible's hard. The Bible says... You say, well, there you go again, preacher. You're always saying this is what the Bible says. Uh, remember what they said to Jesus? They said it's a hard saying. Who can hear it? And Jesus looked over at the twelve and he said, well, you also go away. And 120 disciples left and there was 12 don't be looking around at the numbers anyway I, I get sick of hearing that don't look at the numbers why don't you just get busy getting your life right and inviting folks to come huh you want to hear the truth come to our church Amen. Hey, we learn the Bible there. Hey, we don't just talk about it. We learn it. Amen. So that we can hear it and we can give it out to everybody else. I was talking about this this, uh, this afternoon as we were going through this. Um, when you have a visitor over to your house, this will help you. When I come over to your house and I need a drink of water, do you run over to your counter and say, well, there's a glass of water. It's been sitting there a few days. Oh, he won't know. Why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Or maybe I come over and say, hey, can I get a glass of lemonade? Well, you've got three or four glasses that's had water in them because you had not done your dishes. And you're like, well, I don't want to dump the water out. I'll just make preacher lemonade out of that water. Would you do that and then put some ice in it and make me some lemonade and bring it out there to me? Why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Is that proper? Well, what about the living water? We expect to give tainted living water that we haven't renewed every day to people. And expect them to swallow it. Are you with me? Well, I'm going to go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and wait till Wednesday night for a preacher to give me something new. That way I'll have something new for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's not how it works. And what we're going to find out is the word of God's like manna. It's fresh for the day. Are you with me? You know why? That's why your preacher likes to study on Wednesday. Now, it's not that I hadn't studied already, but God gives me something new on Wednesday. For Wednesday night. I'm talking about for tonight. Okay? And guess what? You say, Preacher, why do you wait till uh, Saturday? Uh, because that's as close to Sunday as I can get. Right? Amen. Come on, help me. How in the world can it be living water if it's been sitting on the counter for a few days? Amen. Number two, boy, that's judging, isn't it? You can leave here and go, man, Lighthouse Baptist Church, they're a judging church, man. What in the world? No, that's the Lord. Do you feel judged or do you feel convicted? You feel a little anxiety, then you know that the Bible's been speaking to you and there's something you're not doing. Amen. You know the Lord does that. If you get excited about wanting to do something, can I tell you that sometimes the Lord's telling you that he wants you to do it, not delegate others. Huh? Troy says, hey, we need to get that trash taken out. Boy, that's really been bothering me. Well, Troy, I guess the Lord's telling you, you need to take the trash. Now, if you're asking me to help, I'm, I don't have a problem helping, but uh, don't be delegating everybody else to do it, right? Are you with me? All right, let's look on. Com commendation. Remember what that is. He's going he's gonna to tell them what they've done good in verse number 13. Look there with me. It says in verse 13, I know thy works and, uh, and where thou dwellest. Now, this gets kind of scary here, isn't it? Even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Okay, so let's look at the, com the uh, commendation that the Lord gives. The Lord commends this church for two things. Number one, if you look at your notes... Uh, for being a daring testimony before the seat of a satanic cult. 
or occultism. Now, I think that we have a lot of that going on today. And we have a lot of it under the disguise of Jesus. Right. Okay. Now, I'm, you say, how is that? And they, they go under the disguise of a church. Okay. Now, uh, here's where, remember, this is the revelation of who? Okay. And the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. So how important is this book? He says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Talking about this book. He's talking about Jesus. Okay. If this book is Jesus, it is. How can we change it? And who wants to change it? The Bible says that if you remove one jot or one tittle, your name will be removed from the Lamb's book of life. We ain't got to that part, though. That's in Revelation 22. Wait till we get there. Amen? And so, what about those people that have changed it? Huh? What's going to happen to them? Well, they're not, they're not saved. So if we change the word of God from how God wants it written, let me ask you this. If we change it, then that's the foundation of our church. Who are we preaching? Because my Bible says we're going to see this same Jesus. This one right here. Uh, now, I got in a good conversation with my mom while I was studying this <clears throat> about the word of God. And how uh, God holds it over his name. And I got into a pretty good study. I actually write a message about that. How God holds the word of God over his name. So I'm excited about that. Amen. I told you when you talk it while you study. You study. You talk. And you write. All three of those things. It just, it just opens it up. Amen. Try it. It's awesome. Anyway, so here he gives him a commendation. He pats him on the back for being a daring testimony before the seat of the satanic cultism. It says, Thou hast holdest fast my name. Uh, Pergamos was the center of pagan religion, the god of medicine. Amen. Uh, and and a, sip, a, a slip, there we go, this is what she said, was represented as a what? As a serpent. Huh. It still is today. Huh, I wonder why, wonder why that is. Well, I got to go to the doctor first. Really? Who's the doctor? Well, you better make sure that's what God wants you to do. You know, I, I, uh, I believe that God has given us medicine. I believe that God has allowed us to have the knowledge to do some things. But I believe also that we've twisted a lot of that. We have. And we have to have a medicine for everything. Well, my nose itches, so I've got to go to the doctor. I must have some kind of nose itch disease. I'm just saying, that's the way we are. It is. We're so needing of medicine. Well, I've got some medicine for you. It's called Jesus. Do you know, I have, uh, uh, I had, uh, and I don't know if you've ever had diverticulitis, but I had a pretty bad go with this last one that brought me back home from our trip. I was pretty sick. And I was that close, and I didn't have the peace of God to go to the emergency room. I was so sick that I, every time I got up out of the bed, I almost threw up. I was so nauseous. I was in a lot of pain, dizzy. I was having vision problems like I couldn't see. But I had the peace of God that God understood. He didn't want me to go. And I'm like, well, Lord, why, why don't you want me to go to the doctor? I, I feel awful. I don't want to. I'm not going to want my intestine to explode. You know, that's how we think. Right? That's not going to happen. You're being a hypochondriac. Now, this is my conversation with the Lord. I just had peace. I needed to just calm down. Right? The Lord was right, wasn't he? The Lord was right. We want to, you know, sometimes we force things because we get in a panic. God of medicine. Amen. All right. Here we observe that Satan's seat is not in where? Uh oh, that's not what that's not what Hollywood says. Hollywood says that Satan has free reign to go back and forth from hell to earth. Really? Huh? We can quit watching TV then. Okay. There's a lot of video games that portray going down into uh, uh, hell and fighting Satan. I mean, you know, if you're going to go down to hell, you don't get to go there on your choice. God throws you there. And number one, number two, you don't get to go to and fro. Okay. And number three, Satan's here. Just like you are. 
And he don't get to go back and forth uh, to hell. He don't have that power. Only Jesus had that power. Only he has the keys both to hell, Hades. He has the keys to death. Satan doesn't have those keys. Notice where his throne is. It's right here. It's right here, amen. A common misconception not taught in the word of God. Notice how uh, Hollywood and the world, they want you to think one thing, and it's actually totally opposite of what God says. Have you ever noticed how the world also wants Satan to look like he has horns and a pitchfork, pitchfork tail? What is that? My Bible says that Satan is one of the most beautiful angels that was ever created. He was the highest angel. He was actually a musical instrument. I'm just trying to help you. Hey, hey you want to know why you're uh, know why he uses music? Want to know why you're so hooked on music? We're musical beings as well. But Satan is a musical instrument, and he knows how to use music to make you do all things. How to change your spirit? Hey, why why is it that those people that died listening to music, or killed themselves listening to music? Come on, we know what music we're talking about. Uh, some of that music, that you, remember back in the day, you'd play it backwards and it would say uh, bad things. Kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. Huh, subliminal messages. Who, who would give them the idea to do that? Well, his name is Satan. His throne's here. We also observe Satan is behind all false religion. Because remember, what does Satan want to be? He, why was he kicked out of heaven? I want to be Jesus. Okay, so why? Now, hold on. I'm trying to help you here. We see that because go to the Bible store now. Really, is that a Bible store? Where's the Bible? Where's the Bible? It's a sad day when you're friends with preachers on Facebook and it's hard to find the King James Bible written on Facebook wall. What in the world? Who are we promoting? That's not the same Jesus. Hey, and you know what? Let me tell you something. The old King James has the old words that have meaning. And guess what? Some of this other stuff, it's watered down Bible. And they've taken the words and made them modern day words that have no meaning. I remember when cool meant that you were cold or it was a chill in the air. Cool today, I, I don't know, maybe it doesn't. I'm old. Uh, cool used to mean hip. <laughs> Since when do we get to change the meaning of words? Do you know what tongue used to mean? The word tongue in, in, de, in, the, in the original English from England means language or the little member in your mouth. Those are the meanings of tongue. Okay, Tongues would be multiple languages. Did you know that? When's the last time you said, hey, do you speak in that tongue? We don't. Hmm. You know what they called the speaking in tongues today's movement? Paul called it unknown tongues. Now go look that up. You know what that means? He called it babbling vain. He said it was like a tinkling cymbal. It didn't mean anything. And it wasn't the Holy Spirit language. They were talking. He said Paul was so bold with it. He said that they were talking to another Jesus. The only other Jesus I know is Satan. Be careful. All right, so here we look, at, look down at your notes. Uh, it would have been easy for the members of this church to have kept silent about Jesus Christ because they were in the minority. Woo! That's scary, isn't it? Now, let me ask you this. Uh, this is interesting as we start to think about this and as we begin to realize where we're at. And if you just look down the road, there's a couple of big mega churches here that run around 3,500 people, 4,000 people uh, when they come. Now, uh, think about that for just a minute. Wow. Well, he can bring a good crowd, can he? But the greatest preacher of all time only had 12. They wanted all to be healed, but they want to hear the truth. If they could just heal me, I'd be good. All right, look at number two. So we're looking at the accommodations. Number two, he's saying, having a doctrinal tenacity uh, in the face of satanic persecution. And it says, and has not denied my faith. Now, uh, what is the word? I had to look it up. I'm not trying to make you feel dumb. But what is tenacity? Help me with that. There you go. Stick to it. Good job, Brother Jim. That's what exactly. Not that you all are wrong. I'm just saying that actually 
kind of what I had written down. It means adhesiveness. It means to adhere, knowing and living as it is a part of you. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, the more that you get in the Bible, the more you'll reflect Jesus. Now, me and James were having a talk about this the other night. Uh, and I've had people come to me and say, well, if when you talk, can you leave the Bible out? And, and at this point, there's no absolute way unless you kill me. Uh, because there's no way, uh, the more you get in the Bible and the more you know about God's Word, the more that you are putting that in your life. Are you with me? And so it's inseparable. And to separate me from God's Word in my life and in my mind would be like telling me that I need to separate from Jesus. Are you with me? Because the Word is Jesus. And so when you ask me something or when we're talking about something, I'll always think something biblical, usually, all right? Or I'll quote a verse. That's good, but the world sees that as bad. And what they'll say is they'll say, can you not talk about the Bible? There's no way. There's no way I cannot talk about Jesus. And, and actually, James is the one who, uh, 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 when we were talking, he's the one who helped me understand that. And all he did was ask me questions, and then I started to talk, and God started to work in my heart, and God was actually teaching me, James, so thank you for asking me that question. And guess what? The more you know Jesus the more you're not going to want to separate, and the more you're going to see that the world's so wrong. Why would they want me to stop talking about Jesus? There you go. Makes them feel like they're doing wrong. You know, it's really not who I am. It's who he is which convicts them. And, you know, the, the, the Jews didn't want to respect Jesus as God or their Savior. Didn't want to respect him as Jehovah. But they did say he came as one speaking with authority. They understood that he had God's authority. They understood that everything he did was God-like. But he didn't have the appearance that they wanted. Are you with me? Okay. Does that sound like the world? Now, I understand that that church preaches the Bible. And remember, in the last days, they will not endure sound doctrine. I'm trying to help teach you while we go through this. This isn't just Revelation. And we're out of here. Hey, that was good. No, I'm trying to teach you something, all right? And it is hard right now because people are not looking to learn the Bible. People are looking to feel good about their sin. You know what? We can tell we're teaching revelations all day long. You know, it used to draw a crowd, remember? But they don't want to if it has anything to do with them seeing something. that. But isn't that what the Bible is? It's supposed to teach us. We're supposed to apply it. If we don't, he's not going to illuminate the word of God. And that neat. I, lo I love the Bible, amen. I wish we could do this all night, amen. Let's go on. So tenacity is adhesiveness. It's to adhere, knowing and living as it is a part of you. All right, now look at, it says, and has not denied my faith. I, I wish, I can't wait to get to heaven. And I hope that that's what the Lord tells me. Not just, well done, thy good and faithful servant, amen. But also, you didn't deny my faith. What, what a compliment from the Savior. Look at Antipas. Means against all. Now remember, he's the one that was martyred. Okay, His name means against all. Now, uh, think about this. He was against all because of their wickedness. Okay, And now hold on a minute. They killed him because of his stand on the Lord. Now, the more you get to know the Lord, just like I said, it's inseparable. Are you with me? And, and so the, the more that you learn and the more that you're in God's word, and it isn't just a week. It's not just a year. I'm going to be honest with you. It's how many years have I been in church my entire life, which isn't long. OJ's like, well, big deal, 50 years. I've got kids that are older than you, right? But, you know, it's a constant being in the Word. You know, really, in all reality, I didn't really get solid in the Word. I mean, I was in it all the time, every day, because at, at our church school, that's, we had Bible class, we had chapel every day. Uh, but really, when you don't get serious on your own and get into it, you don't really learn much. You have a, you have a, you have a little bit in your brain, but don't have anything in your actions, so you don't really understand it. In all reality, I had no idea to even how to do devotion. But then I knew God was calling me to preach, and that's when I really ran. I was like, well, I can't even do a devotion. Well, if you'd surrender, I'd teach you how. Right? 
All right, look on with me. It says Antipas there was evidently the first of probably many martyrs in that city. Amen. First of many. Uh, this, his name is a likeness of his father, uh, sealed his witness with his blood. Wow, that's crazy. Look at the censor. What does censor mean? The fault. All right, let's look at their fault in verse 14 and verse 15. It says, but I have a few things against thee. So let's look at that. Uh, the church at Pergamos was troubled by what? What's that big word? Compromise. I believe that that's a problem today. That's not changed. There are two areas of compromise, and, and this is good, and, and we're not going to skimp on this. So it looks like we only have enough time just to touch this, and I'm not going to stop there because this is where it really gets good, okay? Uh, and you say, why is that? Because these are issues that if we compromise, we're not going to understand what God wants us to understand in Revelations. We're also not going to understand what God wants us to do in our life. Okay, because compromise would mean that you're lukewarm if you're saved. And the Bible says that he'd rather spew you out of his mouth. That's disgusting. Now, back in the day, if you were to spit on somebody, uh, that was bad. That was bad, bad, bad. You don't do that. Amen. Uh, today, if you spit in, well, it used to be if you spit in an officer's face. I don't know what, if they've changed that now, Brother Jim. I guess it's not a big deal anymore. You can do whatever you want to an officer. Uh, well, that's what they're trying to make. Uh, but if you were to spit in an officer, it was actually a felony. I remember when it was. I don't know what's happening. It's, it's a sad world. And the, the, the thing that's going to bring all this civil stuff back where it should be is the church getting right. Okay, stop compromising. All right, here we have it. Uh, here's the very first thing. Number one, I want to touch on this. we got five minutes. Uh, we're going to touch on this, but we're going to have to come back. There ain't no way we're going to be able to read all those verses and numbers, which is very important. Uh, so number one is toleration. Toleration of the doctrine of Balaam. All right? What does toleration mean? Accepting, okay? All right, so what happens when uh, people don't take a stand? or people don't vote, or, or the church don't stand up and do something about it. What happens? Whatever Satan wants. That's what happens. It's called toleration. Well, as long as, oh, wait a minute, men, men <laughs> this, is, this is sad but true, uh, men would rather not fight with their wives and just let their wives do whatever they want because they'd rather their wife be happy than make a, make a big stink. Are you with me? Listen, this is true. I've done this myself. Whether or not it's right or not, as long as I don't have to argue with her, that's tolerance. Okay? Hey, I really want to build the church. I want numbers, so uh, maybe we should stop preaching like that. Are you listening to me? Uh, that's tolerance. Tolerance is this. Tolerance is like, well, I really want that, so. But, you know, that's not how God does it. God doesn't say, well, accept sin, and then I'll bless you. Is that how it works? If we, if we, hey, we ought to just drop our denomination, remember, remember that big saying, drop your denominational walls, and, and hey, hey, we should fellowship together. I've had churches come to me, and not, not too long ago, hey, we should just fellowship together. Uh, we want you to be a part of that, uh, what's those signs that are out all over Waxahachie? Love thy neighbor. Hey, I, I love that. I think that's great. I'm excited about it. I wish we could be a part of it. You say, why can't we? Because they're not going to promote the King James. That's why. And I'm not dropping my denominational walls. That's why. Because it's about doctrine. And I sat down with that preacher that started that, and he had nothing to say. I asked him. I said, so you're going to walk hand in hand down the street with Catholics and with uh, people that don't agree with God and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, he is. I'm not. I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm not going to tolerate it. Hey, I'm not going to do it for numbers. I'm not going to call this, this God's city and God's church. Let me tell you, Waxahachie isn't God's city and God's church. Not yet. Not until we get fired up. We have a city that's tolerating. It's a shame. We have, a, you know why we, we, we <laughs> you know what's happened because we've allowed toleration so long that what's happened is we've got ignorant kids. They're ignorant. And they don't know. Just because you know about political things don't mean they know. They don't. They don't watch the news. They could care less. Right, Todd? 
could care less. Most kids don't know. My daughter doesn't know. She gets her knowledge from her mom. We have to tell her. That movement, I'm not even going to say it, what it is, because we're live streaming. But what that movement stands for right now, you know what I'm talking about, right? Those movements, they don't stand for what the name is. Go read, you know what, it's sad. These people don't even go look and see what they are. Huh? They don't go look and see what they stand for. It's a shame. And it's because we've been tolerant. We've been tolerant. Why are we even discussing whether or not Roe versus Wade is acceptable or not? This is what uh, one of the candidates said. I'm, I'm not trying not to name names, but I should. I should just call them out. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So he's going to make it a law that can't be removed if they get office. Well, I hope that God removes him. Because if he was the child that was being aborted, he wouldn't be here. Shame on us. Shame on us. He says it'll be a sad day if that, uh, I can't remember that lady that's being seated. Uh, hopefully we'll get her to take that. Hopefully she'll take the seat. They're trying to put a rush on it. Because she's talking about removing that. Why do you think they don't want her to be taking the seat? And why do you think they're lying to the American people about how we don't have a choice? We had a choice. We voted Donald Trump. The America voted Donald Trump. Whether you voted for him or not, the majority voted for him. And he's the president. And he's picking her. And I'm praising God for it because she's talking about dismissing Roe versus Wade. You say, what does that mean? That means that no more abortion. That's what it means. Shame on us for killing our kids. I'm reading on Facebook where there's preacher's kids who are talking about how it's okay if they've been raped or if this or that. And Can I tell you, there's no exception to murder anybody. Just because of a sin. Now, I'm going to preach on this, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, I believe. Uh, but just because we choose wrong... Uh, God still allowed them to have that king. And I'm going to be preaching about this. So it was a God-appointed office. So God allowed them to choose, even though it was the wrong choice. So God allowed that office, and God placed a man. So it started out right. That's not the perfect will of God. Every time we get our hands into something, we mess it up, don't we? All right, well, let's stay, stop right here. And uh, I would hope and pray that you would... Uh, Read Numbers chapter 22, because this is very important to understand uh, right here. Numbers 22, go ahead and read all the way down from verse 1 to verse 19. And uh, this is going to be very important because we need to go over this for you to understand the doctrine of Balaam and, uh, and understand also how to apply what's going on right now. And uh, it's very, this, is, this is very good, okay? And uh, there's been some things that have happened that we can see why. If we'll just open our eyes. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, to be in your house. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the word of God and for revelations. And, Lord, no matter where we're at in the word of God, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we can apply it to our life. And, Lord, it's interesting to know that no matter where we are in the word of God, Lord, it applies for right now. It is the living word of God. And what an, what an awesome book that we have in our hands and our possessions. And, Father, I pray that we'd really understand that. Grab a hold of it. Father, be in it every day, Lord, that we can give and share to those that don't know Jesus Christ. And, Father, help to give them the answer. Lord, we love you. Lord, I pray that you go with each and every one of us. Lord, there are those that are not feeling well. We pray for Brother David Smith and his wife. Father, we pray for Deborah and Tommy and Vivian. Father, we pray for uh, Miss Jan, Lord, as she's traveling. Lord, we ask you to put your hand on the Crozier family. Father, I'm trying to think of all those who aren't feeling well. Lord, Don and Benny Odom. Father, there's a lot, Lord, that aren't, aren't doing well. Lord, give us a good night's sleep tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.